Welcome. Thanks for listening to me talk. So, I'm Cheryl Jacobson. I work with letters and I arrange things. I am not a big fan of the word calligraphy. Calligraphy means beautiful writing and it's a little fluffy and it doesn't really apply to everything I do. But people know what calligraphy is in general, so I don't have to explain other things. I prefer letter arts because that covers a lot of what I'm doing. People also don't always know what assemblages are. Um, it's pretty straightforward, but just in case you don't know, it's like a three-dimensional collage. Um, most of the time, my calligraphy and my assemblages are pretty much separate, but I do work them together, and you'll see more later, but I've got some actual commercial jobs or commission jobs that have both of them. This isn't a commission job. This is a birthday card for a friend of mine, and so we have calligraphy and assemblage here. This is an assemblage that I actually did using the drawer of one of my colleagues. Um, this novel is about an English as a second language teacher. And um, so I did the lettering and also arranged to have this drawer shot. This is for a friend of mine who plays the piano, Box Goldberg Variations. Um, doing a little riff here on Rube Goldberg, if you know who that is. And this is another Nathan, who is a musician friend of mine, who's doing an album. So I really love when they go together, um, but they don't always exist together. That being calligraphy and assemblages. So my official title is Adjunct Assistant Professor of Letter Arts for the University of Iowa Center for the Book. And as opposed to a lot of calligraphers across the country or even internationally, I get to teach actual semester-long credit classes to college students, um, which is really rare. Um, so I don't have to, I mean, I can do it with young people so they have their whole life in front of them. And I also get to work with them for a whole semester and make them practice enough to get really good. And I can send people out in the world being really decent calligraphers. And I have the honor of actually having several people who have gone through the program who are actually professional calligraphers themselves, which is awesome. Um, I've been teaching calligraphy and lettering since about 1989. Um, the classes I teach, I teach several classes in modern calligraphic hands. So it's very sort of straightforward. This is how you write. I also teach a history class, which you can sort of see here, where we go through starting with Roman letters and we go through the history of Western letter forms from Roman letters to about when printing happens and we have our normal lowercase Roman italic. And they actually analyze manuscripts. I'll talk about that later. Um, with my normal class, this, the, the next three slides are from what I call my four-week, semester and four-week calligraphy boot camp. Um, this is a full semester. You get three credit hours for it. Um, students work five to six hours a day on calligraphy, and they get really good, really good. Um, and I get all sorts of students. Um, I get students that are really focused on art and craft and meaning, center students, I get art students, I get nursing students and English students, I get engineering students because they can do this for their creative thing. I also get economic students, so you can see this guy actually wrote a spreadsheet for his final project. And I even get football players, which is interesting sometimes. Anyway, they do they, they do an amazing amount of work and they get really good and I'm always amazed at the end of four weeks of crazy working. The history class, we actually look at, well, it'd be nice to look at real manuscripts, so usually reproductions of manuscripts, and we are looking at what the letters look like 
it's always nice to see the fancy letters too, and we do some of that. We lay gold leaf and we actually draw things. But we're really looking at the letter forms, the different letter forms, and seeing how the pen was reacting on the page. And really, once you realize how the pen works, you can figure out what the scribe did. So in this case, this is called rustic. Students will practice, you can see here, they do pages and pages of practicing, just copying what the manuscripts have. And then they do a seven step analysis, writing it out so other people could learn how to do the hand as well. Uh, at the end of the class, after a semester long, or well, I don't ever do the, the history class in the four week thing. This is a regular semester class. And then they usually do some kind of cool final project. This happens to be from a crazy talented woman who cut all her own quills. And you can see she's writing on papyrus here. Um, here she's writing on calf skin. And look how small she's writing. These are dimes. And she cut her quills herself. I mean, you get some amazing people coming through the center. Always blows me away. When I'm not teaching, I get to do calligraphy for people. And I do a lot of jobs, I mean, some of which are obviously uh, sort of typical calligrapher jobs. Uh, I do envelopes. All sorts of different styles. I do certificates. This was a bummer because I did all this work and then discovered that Knudsen is spelled with an O. Sometimes I can fix things, but in this case you couldn't put an O in there. So that is a bummer and I just have to do it over again. I do need to be patient to do this job, and you'll see later on, um, patience is a thing that sometimes I have too much of, but it makes me a really good calligrapher. I do special things in cards and books for special people, which is fun. I can make people cry too when I do really romantic or happy or lovey things. I've done hundreds and hundreds of posters for the writer's workshop. Um, usually I do these, I, I design them, print them on a uh, um, Xerox machine, a copy machine, and then I'll add something else. So I'll do 50 of them, and in this case, I will have written poetry 50 to 100 times, or with Richard Wilbur 50 to 100 times, which gives it a little bit more interest than if the whole thing was black and white. Here's a couple more. So it's great that I get to see the history of the readers of the Writer's Workshop. It's, it's really fun to be part of all that. Um, and here you can see that I tend to be pretty low tech. I do use a computer. I'm not completely computer um, clueless, but I still lay things out. And usually that is faster for me than actually doing it with Photoshop and all that. I do some commercial calligraphy where people hire me to do words and then they put the words on their own graphic design sort of thing. So here I just did Joy and Silent Night and the cards are made. By somebody else. I write on weird things, things like paddles, boxes, boats. Just finished this one, pretty awesome for a friend of mine. Bricks, balls, sorry that's kind of fuzzy, bats, and even bodies. I don't actually write, on, I don't, I'm not a tattoo artist, but I've designed quite a few tattoos, which is really fun. Do logos. You might recognize some of these. Not this one. This is a really new company. Of course, I just write things out for people. Love poems, quotes, um, wedding vows, all sorts of things like that. So I get to really sort of be in people's lives and these things. You'll notice here I spelled whispered wrong. So I had to redo this too. So write nice things in different styles and some weird things, and some not so nice things, but fun. I don't know if you guys are Bears fans, but some people are not fans of Packers. I write on walls in churches and living rooms and schools. This is a Gouda Sakim congregation before it got ripped down and moved. And they even called me up and said, um, could you take your lettering down and help us move it to the other synagogue? And, you know, I don't move walls. And I said, you know, I'm just not that expensive. I'll just redo it on your new wall. 
Um, but they actually did take it down. And you can see if you go into the new Aguda Sakim, um, they have chunks of the old wall up in their office, which is really an honor and really pretty delightful. I also got to work on the walls of the new one. Um, these are all the Hebrew letters of the alphabet in their front hall. And I did other work with within their sanctuary too. Uh, it's just, I get to touch a lot of people and I really like that a lot. I do books. I love working in books. I love it. Um, this is a book you may or may not have seen. It's back when Iowa City was doing all those really, really big books around town. Um, the library asked me if I wanted to work with this amazing graphic designer guy. And they wanted me to use the poem, This Library, that Marvin Bell has written for our library, which is great. Um, the thing is, we got this idea. We wanted to put a medieval manuscript inside of a more modern book form. So I needed to design the poem, which I had written out for them before, really long lines with strange line breaks that just wouldn't work into this medieval book form. So I actually went to Marvin and I said, you know, we got this great idea, um, but it's not going to work the way your poem is. And he gave me hesitant permission to alter his line breaks as long as I let it know. So if you actually go to see this book, which is on the second floor of the public library. If you go down here, it says, this is a calligraphically corrupted version of this library by Marvin Bell. So I have told everybody that I messed around with it. Um, this was so fun. We designed this where I, you can actually go to the first floor of the library and there's a small, it's actually me writing on calfskin. It's a little framed piece. Um, we went to special collections in the library. We actually photographed the four edge of binding so that we could apply that to the corner. And then the back, we were working with um, Eric Wartman and David Nassau, and they completely redid the back of it so it looked like an iPad. And here, this is actually internally lit so you can see all of us who worked on the book, everybody else who was responsible for anything else that happened. And then whoever donated money to make this book happen. And so you plug it in and it's pretty amazing and I'm, it's really nice to be able to see that. Some of my books are really easy to read. Some of them are not so easy. Um, this is a Stuart Davis song that I turned into a book. This, I love doing collaborations and this was a collaboration with a friend of mine who's a bookbinder and we wanted to enter this traveling exhibition of books that have a theme around some kind of time issue. And I mentioned patience before. I tend to have way too much patience and she had not as enough patience. And we did, did this book together called The Nest of Patience. And it's in special collections if you ever wanna see it. It is um, 213 pages. It's in the form of a medieval girdle book. This would be something where if you look down here, this sort of knot you'd put under your belt. So the book would hang upside down until you picked it up and actually read it. Um, everything in here was a combination of quotes about patients, interesting words and objects that the two of us had saved. So it's a collection of thoughts, it's a collection of quotes, and it's a very personal book. You'll notice that the pages are wonky here because when you buy vellum, and I'll show you pictures of this later, the edges are the natural edges of the skin af after it's been stretched. So this is kind of fun because you can look through and see the next page coming up as you turn it. There's gold leaf, there's all sorts of stuff in here. Words that we both liked. This is actually, so this is obviously not a real praying mantis, but this is actual wire and a bead and feathers in it. So this is a very not reproducible book. I mean, it has been scanned, but you really don't get it until you really see it. Some natural holes in the vellum peeking through. It's only about six inches tall. The next book I want to tell you about is also a collaboration, this time with a papermaker. We were going to do a book that was going to um, sit in a show. And this one, she had made special paper and only had so much. So I had a one of a kind, I had to just 
find something to write in this book, and we were going to enter it. And I wasn't quite sure the text I wanted to write. I wanted it to be really visually stimulating, but you need text too. And one morning I was sitting, reading The Press Citizen, and I saw this really interesting line of things that existed and were just sitting in the Iowa City Police Department in 2016. Things that had been collected when people's stuff was robbed. Anyway, all this stuff was there. I thought, oh, that's cool. Let's use that for the book. And I just started writing. And so here you can see all sorts of interesting things. I mean, there were a lot of guns and knives and video games. Um, here you have matches, a Daisy Powerline 880 BB gun. You can see a DeWalt metal cutter, flashlights. Um, there was a, a Saddle Club trophy paintball gun. I mean, all sorts of things. This is also in special collections if you ever want to see it. You can tell that I'm really involved with visual um, visual things and not necessarily being able to read things really carefully, but this is all very legible. And then we come to the, the um, Gospel of Jesus book. This was a book um, that I was commissioned to do in 1999. I had just had a baby, my first kid, and um, somebody came to me and said, I want you to do this book, or do you want to do a book? It's about 55 pages on calfskin. I had never worked with calfskin before, um, with illuminated gold letters and illustrations. What do you think? It's like, yeah, that would be awesome. Who gets jobs like that? Um, and so I did. I had ordered a whole bunch of calfskin and started working, and it was a fascinating, fascinating um, job that taught me a lot. All the illustrations are done just with words. I didn't want to draw people. I certainly didn't want to draw Jesus or anybody. So I recreated images from the words that are on the other side of the page. The first the first version of this book, the first edition, took me a year. When that was done, he sent that to the people who wrote the book in California, the Jesus Seminar. And then he said, okay, now I want another one. I want one for me, um, but I want more pictures. So in 2000, I thought, okay. And then I had another baby and life got involved. And so it wasn't until 2017, 17 years later, that I actually finished this book. Um, it did have more illustrations. And you can see again here, you know, Beautiful writing is not what the, this is, but it's expressive writing, and that's what I love. This is actually about the prodigal son. Um, this is the son, everything he did. This is the son who stuck around and was pissed off when his brother came back and got the fatted calf. And here is images, or light from the party that was happening, which pissed this middle guy off. The other interesting thing about this, though, is the man who commissioned this said, well, I also want you to do Gilgamesh and its translation, and Beowulf and its translation. Okay, that's challenging. Um, so here we have a little, this is actual Anglo-Saxon writing found in the Beowulf manuscript. I, it's a big job, you guys. Um, it's, it's 140 pages of Anglo-Saxon writing. What was interesting though, before that, before I had finished the Gospel of Jesus book, I had started to be involved with these amazing Ober Oberman Center, Center seminars where we would bring in manuscript scholars, but they were not ordinary manuscript scholars who tend to not really care about what the physicality of a book is like. These people actually wanted to know what we call the materiality. So instead of just covering the meaning of the words in these old books, they were interested in how the paper was made or how the vellum was created or how the book was bound or how the book was written with a quill and how the scribe did it. And they put us all together for two weeks and they talked and we demonstrated and we ate dinner together and drank beer together and talked and really got together in a way, we were both nervous to meet each other because 
both sides of this study require so much work you know hours and hours of work to get good at whatever you're doing and we could really use each other one of the guys um, that I got to know actually asked me he said you know I really want to know whether a scribe can really exactly copy what another scribe has done so he said here is a page of the Exeter book and I want you to copy it as exactly as you can and so I did I took a quill and I copied and you'll see this is my writing here um, and he looked at this after I was done and said, wow, you really mastered this. And I said, I really, really didn't. You know, I copied it stroke by stroke. You know, when you're really writing and you're reeling in the flow, you just think and write. And this I was copying, changing the pen angle with every single stroke I was writing. But it was fascinating, you know, to really try to capture what an old hand is. So... You know, I've already experienced with Anglo-Saxon, and the man who actually brought us all together is John Wilcox, who teaches Anglo-Saxon and teaches Beowulf. So it's all laid out for me. There's no excuse. Then my dad died in 2017, and um, it's like, wow, I need to get my act together because life is short, and I have 280 pages to do just to do the Beowulf book. In here, I'm just showing you, this is another project I did using Anglo-Saxon. This is an Anglo-Saxon riddle. Um, and I actually wrote a page of Anglo-Saxon on the calfskin first, sanded it off. So you have little ghosts, ghost writing. It's called a palimpsest. I wrote the riddle in Anglo-Saxon. And then I wrote the, the riddle in English so you could really see what it was. I saw four things artfully traveling in unison. Dark were the tracks, the traces so very black. Swift was its journey, faster than birds. It flew through the air, dived under waves. What is that thing? Well, it was a clear fur. Um, so the four things are three fingers and a quill, flying through the air, dipping into the ink, and leaving traces on the page. How cool is that? Anyway, so I've messed around with this thought, let's do it. I'm going to dive in and start copying Beowulf. And here again, we're not talking about beautiful writing. This is not beautiful. Um, but this is what I was going to dive in and do. Uh, most people reacted like this. Why would you want to do something like that? But it was so interesting and so great. And so each page, I did the Anglo-Saxon first. The Anglo-Saxon, except for the very first page, was on the left-hand side. The English is on the right-hand side. And I finished it this past summer. Um, this is about four pages of nested bifolio. Um, it's now being proofed by John Wilcox. And here you can see the sections of the book. So each section is two pages folded and tucked together. Here's what it's like when you actually get vellum from the vellum guy. Um, it's beautiful. It's beautiful, beautiful, and it's really wonderful to write on. The thing is, when you're actually doing a book and you need these sheets of, of vellum to fold, you have to see how you can get as many out of a sheet as possible. And like I said, it's got wonky edges, and you only get so much. It's not like you're working out of a perfectly rectangular thing. So this particular, I don't know how many, um, I, I didn't keep track. I think I must have used at least 15 skins. And this is goat skin this time, not calf skin. And this is what happened to all those skins and the leftovers I had and the bifolios put together. This was my setup. Um, I actually pulled up large versions of the actual manuscript, which exists in the British Library. There's also an amazing website that's just devoted to, it's called the Electronic Beowulf. And this man has done amazing work, really paying attention to what's going on. I can't get into it now, but I would set up my computer. I, would, I made copies of all the pages, which I could put under my vellum, just so I could have some guidance. It's not that easy because as you'll see here, um, I was looking through the vellum and it's, here's where, this is what I've already written. So now I'm copying these words here. So you can see the F-A-E-H-T-H-E. -E. Um, so it was slow going. And again, I am copying every single stroke, imitating the 
how the, how the scribe actually held the pen so I could get the exact thickness or thinness of what the scribe was doing. Trying to almost feel like that scribe was holding my hand. And here you go. Once I had the Anglo-Saxon done, then I would write on the other side, which ended up being a problem. Um, you can see here on this page, I was using the Seamus Heaney translation of Beowulf, and it's much wordier than the Anglo-Saxon, both because he's taking artistic liberties and because there are a lot of abbreviations in Anglo-Saxon. So the page got way too big. Um, and the cool thing about vellum is that you can erase it. So I thought, oh, I gotta redo this. So I erased it and redid it. So this is the page that I've re, you know, I wrote it, I erased it, I rewrote it. I think I wrote, I, I think I erased like 30 pages. This is me erasing pages. And I'll just show you what it's like. It's, it's really amazing because you start, you start, it, you know, erasing a power sander really helps. Doing it by hand kind of hurts after a while. But you can see the writing just disappears. And this is like in that previous piece. Sometimes I would just leave the sort of ghost writing and write over it. But in this case, you just have to be patient. Make sure you have really new sandpaper. And things eventually disappear. And it's a whole new writing surface. It's pretty amazing. Um, here's some close-ups of different letters. Um, just so you know, um, this is S-W-E-O. So it takes a while to get used to all of this. There's a lot for me to think about. There's a lot for me to talk about. And eventually I'll do a presentation just on this and how the writing goes. I think, you know, normal calligraphers are not gonna be that interested because who cares about Anglo-Saxon if you're actually teaching people how to do hands. But, you know, with, with people who study this, I think it could be really handy. So that's coming up for me. But let's get back to the sort of world of assemblages. Um, found objects, found words, and how they sort of work into the things I'm interested in. I have been really um, interested in, I, I'm drawn to erosion and rust and words just sort of coming in out of context and words where you're sort of ordered to do something. So I love sort of hidden things. This is actually at Mosley's. Um, in my earliest drawings, I used to like, I, I don't have any pictures of drawings I actually did with rubbings of sewer covers or manhole covers, but I've always been really intrigued by them and I still collect pictures of manhole covers and bricks. Um, this just sits in my studio. Again, three-dimensional letters, I'm really into it. Um, when I used to draw in college, a lot of my drawings involved rubbings of three-dimensional letters and drawings of objects, I'd set up these things and I would draw them. And I was really intrigued by the items and how they interacted. Eventually I sort of felt like I wanted the objects themselves and not just the drawings. But you can also see here, well, there's another one with rubbings of letters. But I sort of loved having stream of consciousness writing combined with my, with my marks as well as just calligraphic marks, the thick and thin of lines being really expressive. Um, really, really into that. Although I wasn't really into color, my mother used to worry that I didn't have enough money. She'd go, honey, do you need more money so you can put color in your drawings? But um, I was fine with black and white. Now that I'm older, I'm starting to like color. Um, but again, here we can sewer, a sewer cover. And squiggly writing, I'm not even sure, but it reminds me of this manuscript, which I'm really loving too. You know, the th I'm talking about calligraphic lines here, and you can so see it with these. I just, it's magical. Um, I went to school at Iowa State to f at first to be a, a vet, and then after I took organic chemistry, and didn't do so well, I thought, mm, not so much. So I became pre-medical illustration. And I went through that, um, and that was awesome. I also had an amazing calligraphy teacher in college. Her name was Barbrini, and she really taught me everything that I needed to know. Um, when I left Ames, I came to Iowa City and continued to study calligraphy with people all across the country and internationally too, which was fascinating. One of the things I did was go to Rome with a guy who took study tours 
you know, groups of calligraphers and he would take them anywhere they wanted to go and to study things. So I went to Rome with this guy and a whole bunch of interesting people and we studied Roman letterings. We would spend the mornings actually doing brush lettering and then we'd wander around doing, uh, seeing sights and eating food and doing rubbings. The way we brought the stuff home was to do rubbings of the inscriptions. So I have a whole bunch of rubbings. And also we did this stuff called squeezes, where we would take blotter paper that we brought from home, dip it in water, soak it really well, slap it up on the inscription, and then pound it with a stencil brush for about 20 minutes. And then we would leave it in the hot Italian sun and go eat something yummy. And we'd come back and peel this stuff off. And you'd have these magical forms of the inscri inscriptions you have. Of course, they'd be backwards when you took it off. But here I flipped it so I have a really lovely view of what we were actually doing. Here's a close-up of a bigger, bigger set of letters we did, and we even sort of pulled off some of the moss and stuff. If you guys know what the Trajan inscription is, we actually got to get up on the Trajan inscription and do a rubbing of that. And then we did these squeezes, and we only got picked up by the cops once, which was pretty good. I can't imagine that we would be able to do any of that now. People just don't like you to do rubbings and squeezes of their inscriptions. Here you can see some of my modern calligraphy, and I love the fact that it's three-dimensional. You know, this is amazing because with raking light, you get shadows. Um, if you hold the paper up to the light, the, the white writing turns black. But I'm fascinated with three-dimensional lettering, whether it's my own or something else in metal. This is for a friend. I took an old book cover and actually wrote Fight Like a Girl. She had breast cancer and she kicked it. Yay. Um, also, when we were there, we got to go into the Vatican Library and look at their special collections. So I could see some of their palimpsest. Again, palimpsest is when you have a manuscript, the writing is semi-erased. Um, they couldn't always have it completely erased and they rewrote over it. And there's amazing stories with that. But this has always really inspired me, this whole layering look and having things in the foreground and things in the background. So I sort of do this in my own work. You can see here how there's really light writing and I've written over it. Um, we talk about found objects and found words. This is a project that I did that's hanging in the UI hospital and clinics. It actually uses four full-size sheep, sheepskins. And the university had talked with a whole bunch of staff and doctors and nurses and patients and patients' families and got all these words from them and then said, Cheryl, go do something with it. So my aim with this was to create something that was almost like a visual conversation cloud where if you were waiting you know for appointment or waiting for your father to get out of chemo you could look at this thing and sort of you know try to pick things out little bits of conversation something that took a while to sort of sink in but also had an overall visual look so here's just some details of that you know using found you know found words that are not necessarily as clear as you would do if you were a proper calligrapher. I'm using gold leaf in here too, and pencil. Again, if you ever wanna see this, it's on the first floor near elevator H. Um, I've always collected things. Um, things that appeal to me, rusty stuff, odd found phrases, cool old photos, shards of glass. In fact, at one point, my daughter, when she was little, she was playing with a friend and they broke a mirror and she goes, oh, don't worry. My mom likes stuff like this. She'll just make art out of it. Um, pieces of old machines, textures, bones, and, sc and skulls. Um, I pick us, I all the time pick stuff off the street and in old stuff stores and they end up in shelves in my house. And now in my basement, I have a whole basement full of stuff like this. Um, I started really doing these assemblages in 2006. Um, I used photographs combined, combined with overheard words that I found funny and weird old objects. There was also writing, often writing in them. 
sometimes calligraphic and sometimes just messy handwriting. This first one that I'm showing you right here um, was after I had a, a <laughs> after I had a conversation with two women that I knew were having, trying to have a baby. And I asked them, any luck? And they said, eh, you know, you can only sit, spend so much money on sperm. And I thought, I gotta use this in a piece. And so I had this old photograph of a guy and started writing all over it. And that was my first of these assemblages. Um, more and more pieces started coming out. And eventually I had a collection that made a statement about me and my state of mind in a way that I never expected. There were about 28 pieces, all fairly small, darkly funny or ominous, and quite simple compared to what I'm doing now. Um, there were many eyes peeking out of things. And I really never really noticed that until I showed a whole bunch of kids this collection. And this kid said, you're really into eyes, aren't you? So I just want to show you a few details. Um, these things are are pretty small so I just I like these details not that they don't all have eyes this is from um, my dad and his wife had these great brass um, soap dishes and I loved when they got all yucky up and I, I'd hate it when they'd send them away to be cleaned um, then they were just boring so when they moved and they said, oh, do you want these crappy soap dishes? I thought, yeah. And this is actually at the hospital too, but I don't know where it is. This is, um, this little bit of writing is actually not mine. It's a really piece of old calligraphy from my friend, Larry Yerkes, who was a bookbinder here in town. And this was found inside the spine of a book. Writing. More eyes. Um, between each show of assemblages, which I do them like now every two or three years, I fill up my personal cache of objects and inspirations, and each show has a distinctly different personality. The last two shows that I've done started using old game boards, so they got bigger, more colorful, and happier. And I was happier too. Um, life was just getting better. Um, these days, the objects I pick up, um, here's some more, th these are from some of my last shows. This one's called Fish and Chicks. Had a lot of girly girl things happening in these. And I started doing these fun, I took oh, cheap, birdhouses from uh, Joanne Fabrics and started making, taking them apart and reassembling them. So they're really, really 3D, 3D assemblages. The objects I pick up these days are getting bigger and heavier. And while most of the time I like to wire my objects together or use epoxy, um, I'm starting to wish that I knew how to weld because I'm just finding bigger things and I'm getting bigger at it. Um, this is actually just, this isn't a, an assemblage, this is a bunch of stuff that my partner and I found when we walked around Solon uh, a few months ago. A lot of cool things. And, man, I don't have a picture of it yet, but all these letters that came off some cars made a really cool assemblage. Um, this is actually... <laughs> I was out on Scott Boulevard and by the train tracks I found this bottom of an old barrel and I thought, oh, I can't use that, I can't do anything. But I took it home and yeah, I can use it. It's awesome. So I just want to say, um, I make these assemblages obsessively, but almost without conscious thought. Almost like I have nothing to do with the process but to fulfill it. I, you know, this is one of those things that's just like, well, this got to go here. doesn't have much to do with me, just whatever. Um, so these I'm showing you now, starting with the one with the bar bottom of the barrel, are in my newest show that's going to be opening on the 20th. Yay! Come see it. Um, they're more, they're, they're bigger. Um, my, my first show was called Inevitable because everything I'd done up to that point seemed to lead, lead me there. Um, this new show, which is opening on the 20th, like I said, is called Strong, and the pieces are bigger and more substantial and brighter than ever. Um, it's called strong because we all need to be stronger now with all the crap that's happening, so.
I'm kind of excited about it. It's going to be a really cool show. Finally got to, it's really hard to use Monopoly boards. For some reason they're not, but I finally got it to work, but I had to cut it up and paint it. I'm going to end with this one. This is my first all silver assemblage. And it's very funny because we had gone to Ace Hardware and I saw this thing here, this thing in the middle. And I thought, wow, and it's brand new. Usually I don't use brand new things in my assemblages. This is a clothesline tightener. Who knew, right? Anyway, thanks for sharing my weird things with me. This has been really fun. There'll be a question and answer now really soon. So talk to you soon. Bye for now.